and my talk will be um, about stochastic thermodynamics and our recent results in this field. So, um, so the outline of this is that, uh, of course, you know that not everybody uh, is uh, familiar with the stochastic thermodynamics. So, I would like to first start with a brief review of thermodynamics uh, and its historical perspective, but also tell something about the standard results in stochastic thermodynamics. And then in the second part, I will focus on our recent results, uh, uh, what I did with uh, one is in the, uh, at the hub uh, with Simon, Rudy and Stefan, and one other result is uh, with uh, David Walpert from the SFI Institute. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or whatever, please ask me. Uh, just either raise your hand or um, or just unmute yourself and, and just you know ask whatever you good. So. Um, the relation of thermodynamics to other physics um, disciplines. So there is a main um, hierarchy of scales, I would say. And uh, if you if you start studying physics courses, you start like with classical uh, classical mechanics or maybe quantum mechanics. Then it's always about some small systems, one particle, one object, and maybe two or very little. And then what you need know is that you know every trajectory of every uh, particle, every trajectory of every system. Uh, however, when we are talking about large systems like, uh, I don't know, uh, gases or engines or uh, all these macroscopic systems we see in the nature, we are not able to see uh, to say whether what is the position of each particle and what is its trajectory because they are like in one mole of the mole of the um, is into 24 uh, molecules or atoms and this is enormously large number uh, which nobody can deal with so that's why the macroscopic macroscopic systems have to be described differently and they use only few macro variables and then uh, one of the famous theories about this is thermodynamics that tells you um, if you have a piston and you have the volume and the pressure and temperature, uh, how much work you can get from it, for example. And the connection between these two is studied by statistical mechanics. This gives you the connection between microscopic systems and macroscopic systems. However, Many real systems, especially in like biochemistry, biology, uh, or that are, that are not so big, are on mesoscopic scales somewhere in between these two scales. And here's where stochastic thermodynamics comes into the game. So, uh, in macroscopic systems, you have a large amount of, 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 of systems, and we have only a few variables. In metoscopic systems, this is somewhere in between. So we know something about the probability distributions, we know something about the trajectories, their probabilities, etc. And this enables us to uh, bridge these two um, microscopic and macroscopic scale to get some very interesting results. And typically these systems are far from, very far from equilibrium. So uh, we can, do something with the, for also for the non-equilibrium case, which is very interesting. Um, I would start with a brief uh, course or like history introduction, how the thermodynamics has been evolved. So first we are in the like 19th century in equilibrium thermodynamics. So uh, it's was done by Maxwell, Boltzmann, or Pan Clausius. These guys were interested in how the steam engine could work, or how the maybe refrigerator later when the electricity came, but they were really interested in steam engine, for example. And so they were studying a very big system, it's called thermodynamic limit, so like number of particles is 
very big going to infinity in equilibrium. So they, the fluctuations uh, are very small, so they we can we can we can neglect it. Uh, and the dependence of the major variable quantities on time is that they they don't depend on time. So uh, although it's called thermodynamics, there is no dynamics actually. There is it's more like thermostatistics. Mm, one can be one problem when you study non-equilibrium systems. And then the general structure of thermodynamics is that you have some general laws, or this are called laws of thermodynamics, and then you have some specific response coefficients like specific heat or compressibility and these, these uh, coefficients that you measure for each system separately. And the applications are uh, nowadays in giants, refrigerators, air condition, uh, all tools we are using every day. Um, so here is an example of Carnot cycle. Uh, so this is one of the best known results. So you heat up a gas and then you have a piston and it transfers this heat to some um, work. And uh, this, is, this is described by this Carnot cycle. And it can be shown that the maximum efficiency, so the ratio over the the input energy over the output energy, or the output energy over the input energy, is smaller than one minus the, the ratio of the temperatures, where the T2 is the, the, the cold temperature, so the original temperature, and the T1 is the hotter temperature. And in reality, this efficiency is pretty low. I just checked how, what, how is, what is this efficiency for like uh, car engines, and it's between 20 and 35%, which means that like, 70% of, of what you what you uh, combust in in your uh, engine just goes away, and this is this is quite bad. And it's not because that the, the engineers are stupid or something. It's just because it's not allowed by the laws of thermodynamics because it's a big system and there must be inevitably a large large dissipation of heat. But, uh, so just to do a little bit of mathematics, uh, how we can so how we can mathematically formulate these laws of thermodynamics. So, so people start with the first law. Sometimes they also add this zero for which is sometimes law or not. I have it here from completeness, and it basically tells you that um, tells one that temperature can be measured, which means that that if there are two systems in contact uh, and they are in equilibrium, then their temperatures are the same, which makes sense. So it means that if I put the thermometer in, into my cup of tea, then the thermometer has the same temperature as the cup of tea, and then I can read what is the temperature, and it will be the same temperature as the, as the temperature of the, of the tea. First law, uh, it's been independently formulated by Clausius and Helmholtz, that the energy is conserved. And uh, it tells you that the, the internal energy that is stored in the material is equal to heat uh, plus the work. And now I explain these funny Ds uh, that uh, are in different colors that, well, this D in, in navy or in this blue is, is regular D. It, it means that when you change the when you, when you change the internal energy, then it doesn't matter how you change it. So how you make the process, it depends only on the state you end, where you end. Uh, on the other hand, the, for for the heat and the work, it doesn't it does matter. So 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 there are many ways how to go from one point to the other point, like from one temperature and pressure to other temperature and pressure, and this in each case gives me different heat and different work, which means that that uh, I have to think what is the best way for me, uh, and inevitably I cannot change the whole internal energy into the work because there must be some heat dissipated. This is this is what the thermodynamics tells, and this is the second law of thermodynamics uh, that has been 
also formulated by um, several several physicists independently and it's uh, basically one can formulate it as that the heat cannot be fully transformed into work and in this mathematical formulation it means that that there is this heat and the heat over temperature is smaller or equal than some any uh, variable or function that is called entropy and it's again the state variable so the entropy is the variable that also doesn't depend on the way how you how you get there it only depends on the state where you are uh, and this is important because this tells you how much of this entropy how much of this entropy must be dissipated in case if you do it do your process very slowly so called quasi statically then the change of the entropy is equal to the change of heat or the temperature and but this, this but this, this is this is very slow so practically in, in, in infinite time if you do it faster then the part of the entropy that is called entropy production will be will be non-negative and this is dissipated this you cannot use again and then for completeness i also mentioned the third law of thermodynamics uh, which just tells you that the you cannot bring the sy system to to absolute zero but it's more like connected to quantum mechanics so you don't have to care about this for this moment good and now uh, let's go to the 20th century uh, to something called local equilibrium thermodynamics on linear response theory uh, it, it's been studied by Onzaga, Rayleigh, and uh, other people. And here you make a small generalization. You consider that, that you have systems close to equilibrium. So you have some small subsystems, A, B, C, uh, and they are, they're each is in equilibrium, but they are mutually not in equilibrium. And then you say, yeah, they are very close to equilibrium, so you can express the total entropy as the sum of the entropies. And then you calculate this entropy production, so this part that is not reversible. And then uh, you define thermodynamic forces and thermodynamic currents. And uh, the fourth law of thermodynamics that was uh, formulated by Onsager, and he got later the Nobel Prize for chemistry for that, is that this entropy production is a symmetric function of this Lij matrix, which is called Onsager matrix. Um, good. Uh, now I think uh, we can move on, and we move to like current situation or from nineties to to present, and it's called uh, the this uh, field is called stochastic thermodynamics, and uh, many people are uh, have studied this, and and the founders of this I would call is are. Uh, Tebra Evans, uh, Chris Karczynski, uh, Udo Seifert, uh, Christian van den Breck, uh, and, and many others. There are, there are many people nowadays working in this field. And uh, the idea is to really study smaller systems, mesoscopic systems that are also far from equilibrium. So, so any system that, that is basically not in equilibrium uh, can be described by this uh, theory. And this combines the mathematical tool that is called stochastic calculus. So you know all these random variables and stochastic processes and non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And the main results are like uh, trajectory thermodynamics, fluctuation theorems, thermodynamic uncertainty relations, speed limit theorems, and, and many, many others. And the applications are like colloidal particles and soft matter biochemistry and molecular motors. And now to one nice example, which is the Molecular motor. So this is like how uh, the, the how how the things are transported in your cells. So there is a meals in uh, sorry. This is uh, yeah, meals in uh, uh, molecule working on a acting filament. So you see that there is a filament, and the, this uh, meals in is having some cargo and and going back uh, and going in one direction and. This is possible not because of the temperature difference or something, because the scale is so small that there are no temperature differences, but it's 
uh, because of the fluctuation. So, so of course, in your cell there there is water, the, there is fluid, and it it makes the Brownian motion. So, so the par water particles are hitting there and back to the myosin, and uh, it looks like that that there is the potential, uh, which is uh, asymmetric, so to say. So you see that that there is a big asymmetry here. So, so once you like go up, you spend some energy, and then you randomly go in one or the other direction. But since there is much more probable that you end in this volley, where then you may feel lower energy, you go the whole way there. Uh, there is some probability that you end in, in the same, like in the same uh, level, and a little prob probability that you go back. And this is the this final figure. So on average, the, it, it moves forward, but it's not because of that they would have some some like engine. It's because they make use of the fluctuations uh, in a very smart way. And for these more engines, the efficiency is not uh, bounded by any uh, difference of temperature by anything. It's it's bounded by by the maximum efficiency by one. And in practice, these small nano uh, robots or molecular monitors uh, are much more efficient. It's like 80% or even more. So really our body knows what is the most efficient way. Okay. Uh, good. Yeah, I will. Just read this. Uh, yeah, and now a little bit of the mathematics of stochastic thermodynamics. So uh, typically, what is con uh, what is considered is linear Markov dynamics. So no memory, uh, just that your uh, transition depends on your current state. So uh, we don't see any, any memory. So it's like in discrete cases. Master equation in continuous cases called Fokker-Pan equation, and you have some transition rates that tell you what is the probability that you change from one state to the other. And now we define something that is called entropy of the system, and we are we have been talking about this a little bit before, uh, but now this is the so very very no, well known formula called Shannon entropy that was independently uh, used in many uh, branches in, in thermodynamics. Gibbs was the one that who, in, who invented it. Uh, uh, in information theory, it was Shannon, and then it spread to many disciplines. And here's this formula. So it's minus sum of P log P. And then you can make this um, procedure called maximum entropy principle that you maximize this. And you get the equilibrium distribution, and it's called Boltzmann distribution, and it has this form of, of the one over partition function, and then this is the Boltzmann factor is exponential over my one over minus beta. Okay. Um, so uh, and now. Um, yeah. What what was the epsilon there? Was it? So epsilon i is just the energy of the of the state. Okay. <laughs> Each state, each state i has the energy that, that is given to the state. Okay. Yeah. Now you have to make a small assumption that is called lethal balance, such that the stationary state that is that obtained from the master equation of from the stochastic equation, uh, which doesn't change in time, coincides with the equilibrium state. And from this, you obtain this detailed balance that is then very useful when you derive the thing. And then you can formulate the second law of thermodynamics, which is now much clearer than when you use this funny D and the delta, um, at least for me, that the time derivative of entropy can be decomposed into two things. One is this first, um, first, uh, First entropy production, which can be shown that it's non-negative, and the second is the heat flow, 
uh, the entropy or the entropy flow and the, the the entropy flow is actually the uh, the inverse temperature beta is inverse temperature times uh, the heat flow rate so when you um, when you uh, make the the, the the time derivative of s minus time derivative of, of s e this is the what you get uh, on the right hand side of the of the second law of thermodynamics so it tells you that uh, the entropy production this is the how are the difference of entropy minus the uh, difference of heat of uh, heat heat difference over the temperature is different from zero and it must be always non-negative the more positive and the more uh, positive this quantity is the more irreversible the process is which means that you because of this stochasticity you basically cannot go fully turn back which is something that uh, you know from macroscopic systems if you break the glass then of course you cannot go make it back because the entropy fraction or the entropy has been increased and the, the process was irreversible uh, however if you do it for like if you have a one particle and then uh, you go there and back you can do it as you wish because there is no entropy production uh, okay so and now let's do a last step to consider not the thermodynamics for macroscopic quantities but thermodynamics for the trajectory so we have a trajectory that is this stochastic trajectory and um, it basically tells you that that sometime i stay in state zero then i jump to state one then i stay then i jump to state x2 and then i jump back to x3 and this are the energy levels that can change in time due to some control protocol uh, that will then tell you how much work you can extract from this and then you calculate the probability of this trajectory and then you do similar thing but you like do it backwards so you do the reverse experiment where you do the reverse trajectory under the reverse protocol so it's something like um when you are, when you play a movie there and then you play the movie backwards uh then uh these probabilities of these trajectories of appearing of these trajectories can tell you something about the reversibility or irreversibility of the system and uh, there is the i think one of the nicest theorems in the stochastic thermodynamics that is called fluctuation theorem and what you define is the entropy which is this uh, the, the minus log p so if you then sum over all p so if you do the sum over px log px so do you do the expected value of the trajectory entropy you get the ensemble entropy and the same with the ensemble entropy production and ensemble entropy flow and then what you derive is this nice formula that the log ratio of these two probabilities is the entropy production uh, and then you can finally derive the, the detailed fluctuation theorem that, that tells you that the probability of observing some um, entropy production over the negative value is exponentially smaller, which means that in microscopic systems, you can observe negative entropy production. So we can observe the violation of the second law, but the probability that you observe is exponentially small, which is like demonstrated on this example uh, figure where you see that this is a zero entropy production and means that it's in it, like the peak is very sharp and big and, and larger than zero even the maximum value can be below zero but then the tail is very heavily tailed and then also observing the very big entropy production is also probable and the integration fluctuation theorem, so when you integrate over the all trajectories, and tells you that this expected value is always one, 
And from this, you can easily derive that the, the ensemble average, so when you ensemble over the all trajectories, then the, this ensemble average uh, entropy production is always non-negative. So for ensemble um, averaging, which means the getting back to macroscopic systems by by large number of repetitions, you recover the second law of thermodynamics again. Good. Uh, so this was uh, about the introduction to the stochastic thermodynamics. And now uh, maybe uh, I would say, uh, do you have some questions about this part? I, I have a question. Do you hear yeah. me? Yeah. yeah. Um, you 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 were quite fast there. So in in I think it was point five, the one before this. Yeah. Uh, do you calculate this this part? Is this particle? Do you think of I don't know uh, like, uh, like a Brownian motion? You have a big particle in a, in a sea, or is is this? Can you do this for every single particle in your regular? Yeah, 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 yeah. Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, it, you can either like, you, yeah, you, you can do it for for um, any type of the particle. The the way how how it diffuses is given by this mass by this transition rates in mass equation. Here it doesn't really matter. You can do it for any kind of system, and okay, there will be just different rates. But I look at a trajectory. That's the yes, thing. and you look at the trajectory, and you you look at the probability of observing the trajectory. So um, this is this is what you can do with any kind of this system. Okay, and and on the slide before, I'm I'm sorry, I, I should have yeah, passed yeah. immediately. Um, what um, what? Entropy flow rate. I with if I have a flow, I would expect the system boundary or something. No, no, no. It's it's the I would say terminus technicus. So so uh, so the, the entropy flow means that the, 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 the this this difference or the change of the entropy is minimally the change of the heat times the inverse temperature. And uh, yeah. this was the second law of thermodynamics of the macroscopic system here. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is the minimum. So if, if we have the equality here, this is the minimum and this is called entropy flow. And everything above this is the entropy production. Okay. And, and here is, is that you can nicely, not only show that it's not negative, but you can calculate it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is okay. the, how much irreversible the process is. Okay. I think now I now I understand. Um, I also have a question. Yeah. Um, is this straightforward that you just take the derivative of the Shalon entropy and you get the um, entropy products in non-zero? It's uh, the entropy production is non-negative. Yes, non-negative. I mean, it, yes, it just, uh, yes, yes. This is this is based on 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 very nice simple inequality. So this here is considered as variable x, this is variable y, and here you have the same x and same y. And you can show that when you do x minus y, times logarithm of x, of x over y, it is always non-negative. You can do it by yourself as an exercise. Yeah, no, 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 I, 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 I see this. I just want to ask this question because uh, if this is just straightforward taking the derivative of the yes, standard yes, entropy, yes. Why people take so long time until they realize the importance of this inequality? Good, good question. Uh, yeah, good question. <laughs> I mean, I think it took so much time because the, they didn't realize that they could uh, connect these two uh, theories, like the stochastic dynamics and thermodynamics. So once you have the focal bank equation or mass equation, then it's simple, but this idea of using this took some time. Uh, it's 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 not complicated, but but uh, you must have the idea. So can I say something? Yes. They, they, to them, there's a book by Charles Kittel. This is from 1930 or 1940. 
And they or he very much discusses the possibility of negative entropy production. So people were aware, they just never felt like um, doing it in a systematic way. Mm. We're aware if the system is very small, of course, you can get uh, negative um, yeah, order by chance, so to say. So if you want to read that book, I have it in my office at the Met Uni. Mm -hmm. Really nice to read. Yeah. And also, oh, I, I think you. that also they try different ways, like to extending this linear response theory by uh, considering nonlinear responses and other things. And basically, it took some time to, to, to use the stochastic calculus in here. Okay, so now um, let's go to the things that we did. And um, it's going to complex systems. So all of this, what I showed was considered for systems that are composed of, of interacting subsystems. But in standard stochastic thermodynamics, they, it works only when you have weakly interacting sub subsystems uh, that can be at least approximately treated separately, which means that there are no long correlations. So if you, if you have distant, if you have distant subsystems, if you understand part of your systems, they are not correlated or very, very weakly. But this is not the case of many complex systems as we will see. And then um, the channel entropy or linear Markov dynamics might not be the best description. And I will show you two examples of complex systems and their thermodynamics where it is really better to describe them uh, in a different way. And the first is the structure forming systems. And the uh, thermodynamic of structure forming systems, this has been described uh, in a recent paper uh, with Simon Linda, uh, Rudy, and Stefan. Uh, we can think of a uh, simple model, called magnetic model. So consider that you have coins and you choose a coin, each coin, and, and it is head or tail. But the points are also magnetic, so you can also stick them, two of them together. And then you can have the states like that some of the points are sticked, some of them are not. And uh, this is the table of configurations for uh, when you have one coin, two coins, three coins, four coins. So you see that for one, it's just head and tail. For two, you have head, 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 tail, tail, head, tail, tail, and the one extra state that is the that is the, the, the sticky state. For three, you have 14 states. For four, you have 33. And it turns out that the number of possible configurations grows faster than the normal systems. So then you just do the combinations of systems. So for example, only when you have head and tails, but it goes like, E to N times log N, so N to N basically, which seems that it's a little bit faster, but actually it turns out that these sticky states are dominant for large systems. So you have to count with that. And, uh, and if you want to do the thermodynamics, then of course you saw that you need the entropy for this. And then maybe the channel entropy is not good for this. And here I would recall the very well-known Boltzmann formula. That is that the entropy is just the logarithm of the multiplicity of the system. And I will explain what the multiplicity means. Uh, the multiplicity is defined as the number of microstates corresponding to a mesostate. Now, what is the microstate and what is the mesostate? So we have now three words, microstate, mesostate, and maybe macrostate. Microstate is really a state of each particle. So if it was a ball, it was the, the position and velocity. Uh, mesostate is how many particles are in this given state. So how many particles have, I don't know, this are, are, are in this region and have this velocity. Then the macrostate would be something that is really just a few numbers. So temperature, volume, pressure, etc. And the example for the, uh, for the molecules is that you can have a like microstate, which is head, tail, head. So the first coin has head, the second has tail, third has head, or the first head is, is tail and, and the two letters are heads. 
or the head, head, tail. And these three are all belonging to one meso state where you only count how many of the coins that you flipped are on head and how many of them are on tail. And here the meso state is called two head, one tail. So I, I, I have one coin with tail and two coins with head. And you calculate the multiplicity, which means how many of these uh, situations can happen. And here it's, for example, that this can three versions because either first or second or third one is tail. Similarly, if you have a one coin that is on head and one uh, molecule or one cluster that is this created by two, two coins that are stuck together, then either uh, the, the second and third can stick together, first and second can stick together, and first and thirds can stick together. And again, uh, this mesostate uh, represents three microstates, so the multiplicity is three. And now you can imagine that this gets a little bit, or not crazy, but a little bit more complicated when you get to larger systems and when you also allow that not only two particles can stick, but also three particles can stick or three coins can stick, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. So I will just show you a general mechanism how to do this. Then you can read all the details in our paper. We did some um, work to, to explain it very, very um, I would say precisely. Uh, what is the exact definition of microstate? What is the exact definition of mesostate? But, I don't want to go to many technical details. So basically what you do is that you have the, if you want to calculate the, how many mesostates uh, are represented by three molecules uh, or how many microstates are, are be belonging to the mesostate where you have three molecules of size three. Then of course, what you can do is that you can change the, and then you, then you, let's say number or order your particles. So this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six, etc. And then you get the same microstate when you permute all the all the molecules in in all possible ways, which gives you the number of molecules factorial. Uh, and then what you can do again is that you permute the particles in the molecules. And then you get the total multiplicity when you multiply these, uh, these numbers. So the total multiplicity is given by the, this number that, that you do the all permutations, but then uh, these permutations that, that I showed basically are not the permutations that contribute to the, to the new state, so to say. Uh, and then you can derive the general formula, which is this one complicated, but uh, you can do this. And here I want to just say that uh, already uh, Ludwig Boltzmann in his paper from uh, 2000 and, um, 1884, or it was like 1883, uh, he was somehow aware of this. So he was considering that you have uh, an, uh, eight atoms of chlorine and uh, B atoms of uh, hydrogen, and he was asking how many possibilities is that I make from this N1 chlorine molecules, uh, hydrogen molecules, and chlorhydrogen molecules. And he did pretty similar thing. Uh, the only difference is that we generalize it for um, arbitrary number of states, arbitrary size, etc. Uh, and then you can get something that, uh, so you, you calculate, you use the very same formula as C proposed. So you take the logarithm and then you make some straight cal forward calculations and that, then you get the, uh, the entropy, which is like same like the Shannon entropy. So this is the P log P that we saw before, but then there are some terms that are like, Corresponding to the to this um, to the structure forming term, so this term depends on the total number of particles and size of the molecule. And uh, this is something you have to add to this to get the version of the formula. Uh, and uh, then you can do the same when you 
you have a bit larger system and you say not every article can interact with each other and you, um, you uh, introduce a concentration um, and you get a small correction here. And then the, this equilibrium distribution we saw uh, last time, uh, then there is an additional factor, which is alpha J, where the J is size of the molecule. So this is the Boltzmann factor, but this is the size of the molecule. And here's the concentration. And now I would like to show you not the calculations, but maybe the examples so that you can see how it can be used. So first is that uh, what we found out that this is well comparable with the normal ground canonical uh, approach where you basically, if you do chemical reactions, then you model it in the way that you say, I have a particle reservoir and if the, if the hydrogen atom, uh, if the hydrogen molecule um, reacts with the chlorine molecule and it uh, makes the hydrogen chlorine, I have a like reservoir of particles and I basically remove these the hydrogen and chlorine and at one particle of the at, at one particle of the hydrogen and chlorine for example and this is this 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 is this is the standard this is the standard approach here in this approach this is like an especially for small systems it's, it's an approximation because you assume that the particles the number of total number of particles operates in the system and it works well for a large system but especially for small systems we see some deviations. So for large systems, you see that the specific heat uh, really is point side, but for small systems, uh, there are some deviations. So here you can again see that for small systems, you have to consider this correction. And uh, here I would like to show two examples how you can apply this. One is that um, in soft matter uh, is the phenomenon called self-assembly that the, the nanoparticles, coiled particles uh, that are made of tens of uh, molecules of atoms or hundreds uh, can have parts that two halves that are that have different properties. So, for example, one is called one is uh, hydrophobic and one is charged. So, particularly this type of particle is called Janus particle, Janus was the Roman god that had two faces and similar to this god, this particle has two faces, so two halves. And if the, if the, uh, if the, the hydrophobic parts are like lying together, then, then it attracts and then uh, they, they make a bigger cluster or molecule. And, and if the, if the charge part uh, is closer, then they repose themselves. And you see that it, it can be hey, more yeah. like, yeah? This is Andrew here, hi, thanks. I'm really yeah. enjoying your talk. I, I just have a question. Um, yeah. In your basic presentation of the theory, uh, it seemed as though the, the heads or tails state of each particle basically commuted with the with the sticking state of the of the ensemble of, of coins, so it didn't matter which way the heads or tails were pointing, uh, the, the the coins could stick together anyway. Is that so? It, yeah, it yeah, seems yeah, like yeah, yeah, two yeah, levels yeah. of organization are completely yeah, 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 independent. Yeah, 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 you are right. Yeah, uh, in this mod, yeah, in the in the sticky coin uh, model, uh, you don't have this freedom that it, they don't stick or do stick, or you can model it as, as, as randomly. Here you are a bit smarter. And then you really uh, integrate over all positions and all like um, all configurations or angles like here to to calculate the probability uh, of whether these two particles form a molecule or not or three or four, and then it becomes much more complicated. But in principle, the the, the theory or the entropy you use is the same. You are right. The magnetic coin model is, is much simpler in that. Here you have a bit more sophisticated uh, approach where uh, you have the state of the of the of the of the um, particle is not only whether it's head or tail. It's the position and momentum uh, uh, or position and angle, and then from this you calculate whether it's like sticked or not. So you, you have to you have to calculate okay. whether it creates a cluster or not. Okay, so 
Do I understand yeah. correctly that in, in, in this example, you, you have an interaction potential that depends on yes. the internal state of each, of each yes. sphere, yes. right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and actually... Yes. Okay, so, so that, that seems to have... So that, that, that seems to introduce an extra degree of freedom compared to the, the magnetic coin model. Is that right? Yes, yes, but, but then in the thermodynamics uh, perspective, you you um, average over all of these degrees of freedom. So you forget all, over all the, the positions and momenta uh, or, and uh, angles. Hmm. You just you just uh, uh, calculate the probability of n particles being stick together. Okay, so great, thank because, you. Because this is what you are interested in. So, so in this case, you are interested only in whether you see a big cluster of uh, particles, not in their exact positions, because I mean, it, it can be a huge number of, it, so the configuration space is enormously big, and even it's no hope that you would uh, go over all the positions, so uh, even the calculation must be done numerically by some very sophisticated methods. And uh, mm -hmm. but in the end, you are uh, interested in the same kind of prediction. So whether uh, the, the the particles are like free or are bound. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, this I can show you on the next actually on the next diagram. That is that really what you calculate is the average cluster size, which means that you here have you have that uh, hundred particles and they. Uh, depending on the temperature and concentration, make some clusters. Then you, uh, or molecules, if you, if you want, or it's called clusters here. And then you calculate the average cluster size. And you see that here you can observe three phases. So this is the fluid phase where you only observe small free particles or only small clusters are, are created. Here it's condensed phase. So basically then almost all of the particles form a big cluster or there are cubic clusters and there is the transition this is called coexistence phase there are both like big clusters exist and also some, some free particles still exist and this is what uh, people in this self-assembly theory in soft matter observed and uh, they even observe more sophisticated uh, phenomena like that that uh, particles not only form these clusters or uh, that they form different structures like they can form long polymers they can go, do the micelles and they can do many other structures so this is of a direct application um, how you can do this and I would mention something different that is if you take a, a easing model, a spin model, so you have the spin up, spin down, and then they are all connected with each other. So it's a bit similar to the magnetic coil model. And then you allow any of two to stick together. And then you say, if they stick together, then no field is can be applied because the, the, they are magnetic. So you can, um, you can have some magnetic field is applied to the system, some external field, but if they two stick together, they are neut neutral, so to say. And then what you calculate is this magnetization diagram, so it's a phase diagram, and normally what you observe, this is all known in um, statistical physics or theory of critical phenomena, is that you observe the second order transition. So, so it means that even without the field, without the external field, there is still some magnetization, which is like depends on the temperature and with low temperatures, you also observe the, the, the magnetization and then it continuously decreases to zero without any jump. But for this case, you observe so-called first order transition. So when you go from low temperature and you go, 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 and then suddenly jump to zero magnetization. But when you go the other way around, then, then even in this, where you, where you went down, you go a little bit further and you have still zero magnetization. And just after that, you go there. So basically the presence of, the, of the, this magnetic state, this bound state changes the 
the totally the, the behavior of the system. It changes the order of the transition. So uh, this is something that, that we can model with this entropy. So this is another application of this. Uh, do you have some questions about this uh, structure forming systems? Time. Okay. If not, I will just briefly mention one. Ah, yeah. One one last thing is that we. I was talking about stochastic thermodynamics. You were um, rediscovering or recalculating the digital fluctuation theorem, and here it works as well, which is good news. And just, you have to add to the entropy production. You have to add this difference between the initial uh, size of the molecule and the final size of the molecule. So there is a small um, correction to this term, but luckily the, the digital fluctuation term holds, which is which, which is nice because it shows you that this is much more general than um, it's not based on channel entropy and it's really not specific. And specific. Good. Uh, some questions to this? Then I would just very quickly tell you about uh, very recent work with David Wolpert from SFI. Uh, and also external faculty member of the hub. Uh, there, mm, you can, of course, generalize the stochastic thermodynamics in many different ways. But the truth is that the, the stochastic thermodynamics is based on this linear Markov uh, dynamics. And uh, this is relatively general, but not all the systems uh, fulfill this. So of course, some of the systems are non-Markovian, so they have like long memory, but also, especially if you have the many body interaction, then the effective uh, description is done by the nonlinear Markov dynamics, which basically means that in the original master equation, we had the PJ here. So here we put some function of the PJ, so of the probability distribution. Uh, and we set up the requirements that this should have, that the system should have. And we were asking the stochastic thermodynamics, uh, do the laws of thermodynamics still hold? And the answer, as you, see, as you will see, is that yes, it works in a way because you have to change something. And the requirements was there that we have this non linear mark, mark of dynamics. We have this still the detailed balance, and we still have the the um, second law of thermodynamics. And we were considering some not only channel entropy, but we were interested in like maybe more general entropy. So we basically took this class that is called some class of entropies. It is the function of the sum of some function of uh, the probability distribution. So channel entropy is that if you take f is one and g is minus x log x, then you get channel entropy. And what we found out is that there that if the, these requirements should hold, then uh, it implies that there is the relation between the coefficients in the master equation and the form of the entropy. So so the, the this is the g from the entropy and this is the f from the entropy. We found out that the, the omega must be like this and the CP must be like this. Basically, for the nonlinear systems, you cannot use the Shannon entropy functional, but you have to use some other entropy functional, such that the, the laws of thermodynamics, like the second law, still hold. And what we also showed is that uh, when we define the stochastic entropy in a very similar way as in normal systems, and still the detailed fluctuation theorem hold, which is very nice because, again, it shows that the detailed fluctuation theorem is uh, much more general than uh, just being depending on some particular type of evolution or particular type of system, particular type of interaction. So it's really similar to the Macroscopic second law of thermodynamics is, it seems to be very general law that uh, holds for mesoscopic systems out of equilibrium, which is, I think, very nice. 
And uh, that's basically it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And if you are interested more in stochastic thermodynamics, there are some more events. So next Friday, there will be a, a talk by uh, Gulci Cardes, uh, which is like, in a way, follow up to this talk that is called Thermodynamic Uncertainty Relations for Multipartite Processes. It's really recent stuff that might be also very useful, not only in physics, but in other systems. And second is that uh, we organize a conference or a virtual workshop on stochastic thermodynamics, and it will be in May. It will be all virtual, all free. And there will be also tutorials where uh, also people that are not familiar with stochastic thermodynamics will give much more detailed course, like there will be free our courses on introduction of stochastic thermodynamics, quantum stochastic thermodynamics, and information theory of stochastic thermodynamics. And then there will be a very nice conference for five days on different topics. And you can just uh, listen or discuss. And there are many uh, very good speakers. So I would like to very much invite you to this uh, event. And that's all from me. And thank you for attention. And now, if you have any questions, Ah, somebody has raised their hand. No. Then I think if not, then I would like to thank you for attention again and have a nice evening, have a nice weekend and hope to see you in one.